Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about IPv6 basics, and in particular, IPv6 addresses, uh, which may or may not be a new topic to you. We're going to try to cover it in a little bit of detail to give you a running start with it if you haven't heard of it before. And hopefully, if you have and you've uh, you've already done a little bit of homework around IPv6, we'll maybe touch on some things that you aren't aware of or that might be new. So welcome, Scott. Welcome, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Uh, Ed's out today, but we'll trudge along without him as best we can. The best place to start is essentially the fundamental difference between IPv6 and IPv4. So what is the primary difference between IPv6 and IPv4? I guess we can just start with the number of bits, right? Yeah, I think that's one thing that might prevent people from learning about IPv6 is they're intimidated by the the size of the addresses and the way they're written. They look very foreign compared to what we're used to, a very small, tiny little compact quad dotted decimal IPv4 address. That's pretty familiar. But then sometimes people forget what it took for them to learn about IPv4 addressing. I remember my first network, you know, back in the 90s, I was putting together servers and I would use 123.45.67 and whatever was in the last number worked. I don't know what made it work. And then I got yelled at <laughs> by some gray beards like, hey, there's rules. And I, and I was like, oh, there are rules. OK, I'll learn them. And so people forget, you know, we had to learn about IPv4 subnetting, understanding IPv6 addresses and their way they're written. It's just another thing to learn. And so hopefully today with this basics episode, we can break it down and, and make it less intimidating. Yeah, I hope so. I think it's a good point about our history with IPv4. And I think for most network engineers, anybody that has to wrangle IP addresses, there is definitely that learning curve, that sort of moment of a bit of a steeper learning curve around. Maybe initially it's just sort of getting your mind around binary if you're not familiar with it and then having that be expressed as decimal. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, dealing with the format. But then I think it's really subnetting that causes the first sort of set of challenges around like, how does this work? What am I doing here? And of course, in V4, we have the uh, network mask. That's not something that shows up in IPv6, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I think that primary difference, yeah, the larger size of the address and the fact that to keep it somewhat manageable, we have to use hexadecimal. Otherwise, we'd end up with a much, much longer address if we tried to stick to that same just binary to decimal expression that we use in IPv4. And so right away, you start to see like letter characters and it's like, oh my goodness, uh, obviously we've been dealing with them in MAC addresses for a long time, but for a layer three address, it's just kind of a new thing. I think one of the things that trips some folks up too is the idea of the 32 bits to 128 bits. So we're really talking about an address space that's defined by 32 bits in IPv4 and 128 bits by comparison. And IPv6. And so if you're not paying close attention to your thought process, you might be like, well, it's four times as many bits. You know, you get that sort of 4x factor like kind of stuck in your head. And you're maybe not thinking about the decimal expansion mm -hmm. of 2 to the 128, which of mm -hmm. course is this ridiculously large number of 3.4 times 10 to the 38, you know, which is just like on such a scale that it just becomes sort of unfathomable in terms of the overall availability of IPv6 address space. So that's like sort of one gotcha, like right up front. We sort of use comparisons between IPv4 and IPv6 space to try to create some analogies that are helpful in, in getting sort of the scale. And I don't, I don't know what your favorites are. I have a couple that I've used over the years, but maybe you have one in, in particular <laughs> that you're fond of. Gram. Yeah. If an address was a gram, IPv4 would be like a floor or so of the Empire State Building in New York City, where IPv6 would be 56 billion times the weight of the earth. But then a smart person in my class one time was like, well, wouldn't IPv6 addresses be four grams? And I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> but still, yeah, it boggles the mind how two to the power of 128 is. Yeah, I recently used the analogy of the of Legos. Like if you had a set of Legos and IPv4 was your set of Legos, if you used all of your IPv4 Legos to build one grain of sand, using all of your IPv6 Legos in a similar way would allow you to construct the entire planet. I mean, that's, mm. you know, just like some sense of like how massive the space is. But that's yeah. immediately sort of a challenge if you're new to it. And I think that one of the other aspects of the address that gets sort of obscured if you're not sort of thinking about it too closely is that half of that address space, it's divided up. It's essentially divided in half for all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. 64 bits of uh, network so to speak, and 64 bits of interface identifier if we're sticking to the standards in a really, you know, mm -hmm. close way. 
a computer thinks in terms of ones and zeros. And so that 128 bits of ones and zeros are represented in memory bank. And then when the packet is transmitted over a copper or optical or RF network, those ones and zeros are sent as little pulses of light or electrons or wavelengths. And we don't really see that. But when an address is presented to us or we type in an IPv6 address into a user interface to configure IPv6, that's when we're dealing with the presentation format of that address and how it's written in hex characters. That conversion occurs. Our, our robot overlords think in terms of ones <laughs> and zeros, but we, to, in order for the robots to dumb it down for us lowly humans, they got to write it in these hex digits. And yeah, you're right. We split it in half. We have a network number and a node number that the last 64 bits uniquely identifies a node on a LAN or on a segment or something like that. Yeah. And and maybe we can even get a little more specific there because it certainly could identify a node, but you might have multiple addresses. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have multiple interfaces. And even within one interface, this is sort of unique to V6 as compared to the V4. We're used to having like one V4 address on, especially like on a host network interface. But of course, with V6, we can and do have multiple addresses, uh, which of course means we might have multiple interface identifiers, you know, for an interface. And then you might have multiple interfaces on a node. And so you kind of end up with a fairly long list of IPv6 addresses on your host uh, that you're not really having to deal with in IPv4. Let's back up just a second, actually, because there are different types of IPv6 addresses based on their use. Just like with IPv4, you know, IPv6, you know, can use unicast communication one-to-one -one, uh, between a client and a server or something like that, or between two computers. There can be multicast, one-to-many, and there can be anycast, one-to-nearest. But there's different types of IPv6 addresses. With IPv4, we have private addresses, RFC 1918 addresses that have a certain number range. We have public addresses that have a certain range. We have certain reserved addresses range in IPv4 that you're familiar with. And we have similar types of IPv6 addresses based on how they're used or where they're used in the topology or their function. So yeah, I think what Tom and I are kind of talking about is these globally unique addresses. And the first three binary bits are 001. So if the first three Binary bits are 001. So the first hex digit would either be 0010, which would be a 2, or a 0011, which would be a 3. If you see a 2 or a 3 as the first hex digit, that's an IPv6 address that's going to be used for unicast communications. That's right. And then that global unicast address that you're describing, you know, will show up for most folks in terms of if they've gotten an IPv6 allocation from one of the regional internet registries or maybe from their service provider. Like if you have broadband at home where you're actually getting IPv6, which is actually pretty common these days, mm -hmm. uh, you, you'll see one of those global unicast addresses and you'll notice that. I don't know that anything's been allocated out of the three uh, range to this point. So you're always going to sort of see that leading to something like there's some other values floating around prefix wise like you know two zero or two six or but you'll you'll definitely see that two as the as sort of the first character in the address in a global unicast range yeah and then based on the range of ipv6 addresses they've been allocated to regional internet registries and the rars and the different geographies hand out addresses to enterprises and service providers local internet registries in different geographies and the addresses kind of trickle down from there but you're right i don't think i can or iana have allocated any of the three hex digit yet haven't seen that yeah still on the twos <laughs> yeah that's right so that's like our primary unicast that we talked about global unicast allocation we have other unicast types of addresses in in ipv6 we have a uh, we have ULA, the sort of the problem child of IPv6 <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably the closest thing we have to RFC 1918 address space, but it has some caveats. It's meant for private networks, so it has that in common with IPv4. The unique characteristic of unique local addresses is predicated on you creating a 40-bit random number. You use FD to create a 40-bit random number, convert it to hex, and that'll be the next. 10 hex digits, right? 
And then that will give you a slash 48 IPv6 prefix that you'll use in a private secret network that never has any internet access, totally private. Right. So something that ideally you'd use where you needed like much tighter security or something along those lines. But then, of course, we've got some challenges with ULA in terms of how it gets referenced or de-preferenced with modern operating systems. It boils down to in a dual stack environment, you simply won't use a ULA address as a source if you have IPv4 configured on that same host. And, you know, in these days where there's not a whole lot of IPv6 only at this point, you know, it's very likely that you'd be in a dual stack environment. And so deploying ULA, uh, you know, you might wonder where all the IPv6 traffic is if you've got a ULA address configured on your host along with an IPv4 address, but then it's just not getting used because of uh, something called the prefix policy table within uh, within the host OS uh, as defined by RFC 6724, which I think they're in the process of trying to get updated to get around this particular issue. But for now, it just uh, operationally, it just makes it really kind of, uh, you know, DOA, so to speak, for for use in, in production. And for our listeners, we had uh, show number 107, where we talked about ULA, and we also talked about it at length in show 125. That's right. So we've we've talked about those addresses <laughs> quite a bit and some of their limitations when used in a dual stack setting. Right. <laughs> we have multicast addresses. So in IPv4, you may be familiar with 224 uh, or a class D address range. We have the same thing in IPv6. Uh, it starts with FF. So if the first two hex digits are FF, you know it's a multicast. It's a destination address that's used to represent the many in the one-to-many communications. So FF, that'll be a clue that it's it's a multicast destination. And these show up, I mean, there's not a whole lot of deliberate configuration, like manual configuration of, of uh, multicast these days. I mean, if you're running like sort of, you know, multicast to, across... Uh, like protocol independent multicast, it's something that's really, you know, more sort of focused on layer three across the LAN or even across the WAN, mm -hmm. you know, then you might be configuring multicast addresses. But but really, it's sort of with V6, it's more under the hood. I mean, we really, mm -hmm. you know, it's part of like how neighbor discovery works and the way that it works. If you start sniffing the wire, you're definitely going to see a lot of IPv6 multicast traffic. And, you know, we'll leave that topic for another day as far as like what function that's sort of serving, but it's definitely, you know, heavily leveraged in, in IPv6 to replace, you know, address resolution that we use in IPv4 with neighbor discovery and all of the functions that that gives us in IPv6. So you probably have to break out Wireshark if you want to start seeing those, those multicast addresses in IPv6. And then the fourth type of address that I know everyone will see on their computer is FE80 are the first four hex characters in link local use addresses. These are addresses that have a unique property in that they're only used on the LAN segment, um, and they're not used for off-net communications. We really don't have an equivalent to this type of an address in IPv4. IPv4 uses addresses, and then there's you know subnet broadcasts, but we don't have anything that is a link local only type address in IPv4, but we have these in IPv6 and they're they're different. Yeah. And I mean, I guess the closest thing would be like an APIPA address, just basically trying to self-configure a, a layer three address. And of course, in, in IPv4, it's just like, oh, look, DHCP is broken. So I have this useless 169.254 address, which of course, <laughs> if another node on that same link has its own useless 169.254 address, you can communicate. There are circumstances where, you know, you might've had to use that trick to do something operationally, you know, because you couldn't actually get online with a valid address from DHCP. But yeah, your point is still uh, significant related to in V6, it's a, a link local address that actually provides like layer three connectivity for nodes on that link more or less as soon as IPv6 is enabled on on that node on on a, on a particular interface, it will self-configure a layer three address in the form of this link local that you've described and then allow layer three communication at least on that node, but of course not off of that node uh, because of the hop limit that's set to 255, which means that any traffic sourced from that link local address, as soon as it hits a router interface on that, that link, it's, that traffic will not be forwarded. On any host operating system that has IPv6 enabled on it by default, which is virtually all host operating systems these days, it will automatically configure a link local address on its interface. 
without any administrative configuration or, or making it do that. And so you'll see if you did a IP config slash all or IP adder show on your Linux system, you'll see these FE80 addresses on your interface. It means you have IPv6 configured on those interfaces, but doesn't mean you have internet connectivity. These link local addresses are really just to get the computer bootstrapped and communicate with the local router to get themselves kind of going. And so it's it's the address you get before you get an address. It's kind of like you need an address to get an address. And this is the first little, it's almost like administrative uh, kind of bootstrapping address that your computer uses to get up and going. Thanks for being a Packet Pushers listener. Did you know we've got other IT-related shows you might want to check out, like Heavy Wireless? Heavy Wireless is a deep dive into Wi-Fi, IoT, wireless security, and more. It's hosted by Keith Parsons. He brings decades of experience to conversations with wireless engineers, industry experts, and vendors. So whether you're a YLAN specialist already or looking to expand your skill sets, Heavy Wireless gives you the technical know-how and industry insights to succeed. Find it at PacketPushers.net or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, I think we should maybe back up even a little more and at least talk through if folks are, are not familiar with address presentation. I mean, that's certainly something where we, you know, we mentioned at the outset that you're dealing with a 128-bit address and to make it more manageable for us weakling humans, you know, and, <laughs> and our need to abstract things. So we have this hexadecimal formatting that that allows us to get the, the actual overall length of the address down to being at least somewhat manageable. So I think if we start there, so if you take the 32 characters of hexadecimal, that encode the 128 bits of binary. And then you have this, the separator that you have in, in IPv4 that you use a, a dot, you know, but here in, in IPv6, we use a colon between these groups of nibbles that, you know, help us sort of carve out and define that hexadecimal in a way that, you know, keeps it presentable. But you end up with possible maximum length of 32 characters along with the colons that go in between every time you hit four characters, you put another colon in. And so you can have a, a, a total length of 37 characters, which is pretty long. So we have some tricks to sort of shorten that. And and maybe you can uh, let the audience in on, on the first one of those, Scott. Yeah. Well, so we're taking like... 16 binary bits and converting it into four hex digits, we group those and that's either called, yeah, hex tet or a word or a group or a quad or a chunk, whatever you call it. It's like four hex digits all together, uh, zero through nine, A through F. And then you'll have a colon, you have another four hex digits and a colon, and you end up with eight of these hex tets with then seven colons in between. <laughs> yeah, correct, yeah. So when it's all written out, every hex digit, whether it's a zero through nine or an A through F, it's written out longhand. Uh, we call that the fully expanded format. Every hex digit is represented and that's pretty intimidating. That's very long and not easy to memorize. And so we can reduce it oftentimes because the IPv6 address space is so sparsely populated, we end up with lots of zeros in there. And so to make it a little more humanly readable and presentable for us lowly humans, a computer will, as part of printing the address into presentation mode, it will remove leading zeros if there are zeros ahead of hex digits that are one through nine, A through F. It'll get rid of those zeros to make it a little shorter in each one of those segments defined by the colons. So within a particular hex tet, you can always drop the leading zero or leading zeros as the case may be. And you won't lose that information is not lost because the zero is not significant when it comes at the front of the, the hex tet. But when it comes at the back of the hex tet, if you drop a, a trailing zero, that's a different story. You've broken the law. You go to IPv6 jail, your network breaks, <laughs> stuff won't work. But, you know, I'd be lying if I said when I was transcribing IPv6 addresses, prefixes that, uh, you know, it's happened to me. It's probably happened to some other folks who've worked with IPv6 long enough. We've got another trick related to the zeros, though, and that is that if we have multiple hex tets that are all zeros, which, as you point out, it's very likely to happen, uh, you know, with a lot of zeros in, in the overall IPv6, a lot of space, rather, in the overall IPv6 address space that's available. You can actually take multiple hex tets of, like, contiguous hex tets of zero and concatenate those down in, into a double colon. And you can do this once within the overall address, because if you try to do it twice, you'll very likely run into a scenario where you're unable to determine how many all zero hex tets each one of those double colons represents you compressing. And so there's no way to regain that lost information once you've done that compression. You can only do it once. 
but it actually works out pretty well in terms of getting the address to be much shorter. We maybe should mention that this can happen on both the, you know, we mentioned the prefix side or the network side and the, the interface identifier side of the address. Mm -hmm. So we've got this sort of natural division between the 64 bits at the front end that are for networks and then the 64 bits at the trailing end that are for the uh, the interface identifier to identify the interface or the node with the IPv6 address. And these rules, you know, apply the dropping the leading zeros, the concatenating multiple all zero hextets into a double colon. You can you can do that either portion of the address. If you're manually configuring an interface identifier, that's probably where you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of uh, compressing all zero hextets. You know, maybe you just want your interface identifier to be, oh, I don't know, say, one, identify this node as having an interface identifier of one. Well, that means you're going to have 15 leading zeros for that, which, you know, could be compressed down into a double colon and then, uh, you know, drop the leading zeros and you have, so you end up with a, some network prefix double colon one, and then whatever the CIDR length is, which is probably something we should mention as well. So if you had somewhere inside of that fully expanded range, you had 00AB, when the computer prints that out, it'll remove the leading zeros and it'll just be colon A, B, colon. So that's how it will get rid of the leading zeros. That's right. But if you had like 2001, a whole bunch of zeros, and at the very end, colon 00 A, B, that could all be, you know, compressed to 2001 colon colon A, B. That's right. You know, all the zeros in the middle get compressed within that single colon colon. And you don't use colon, 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 or colon, 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 colon. It is, it's colon, colon is two colon characters, represents one or more hex tets that are all zeros. And so the computer is printing it out to us in this very nice, neat format and following the rules of this compression, zero compression and you know fully compressing the address. And then when we type in an address, the computer is going to reverse that process and make sure that it's we've typed in a sane, syntactically correct address, and then it'll reverse it back into you know binary. And so this conversion between binary and hex, you know, numerical to presentation format, and then when we type in an address, gets presentation format gets converted back into binary address. This is constantly taking place. In order to represent the network portion, we have slash notation, which is similar to the way we have slash notation in IPv4. But you're right, you said this before, Tom, we don't have a 255.255.255, .255 like a whole bunch of 255s. We don't have anything like that in IPv6. All IPv6 is CIDR notation, classless interdomain routing notation, everything is slash notation in IPv6. Yeah, that's right. And of course, we lose some of the granularity if some network folks back in the day remember like studying for a Cisco certification or something. And then, you know, the, one of the tests on the written would be a, about how to peel off certain significant bits within a subnet mask to create like these blocks of subnets that were not contiguous and that, you know, you could use then to, to sort of identify traffic in a particular way or, you know, create categories of, of service. It, you just can't do that in IPv6. You don't, you don't have a subnet mask. It would be pretty darn unwieldy to have, you know, if you think about the length of the address to begin with, to have a subnet mask to go along with that. You know, so you have, instead, you have a CIDR length, which just gives you essentially the break between the network portion of the address and not necessarily directly the host portion is that, you know, CIDR length, you, you might have a, a shorter CIDR length that then leaves some network bits left over that would constitute, you know, some group of subnets or some subnet ID that would, you know, be essentially a, a subnet of the overall network prefix and, until you hit that 64-bit boundary that defines the interface identifier. But yeah, that CIDR notation is really, you have to have it in an IPv6 to know where that uh, that break occurs between the network portion of the address and then what's left over the subnet portion and the, uh, then the interface identifier portion. So you may see uh, addresses floating around without it, but it's important and meaningful information, especially, you know, from an address planning standpoint. So yeah, the only product where I've seen a, an IPv6 subnet mask written is on an F5 load balancer. They ask you to specify the subnet mask for an IPv6 address on the load balancer, and you can't say 64 or slash 64 what it wants. And the data input is 
FFFF colon FFFF colon FFFF colon FFFF colon colon. <laughs> it's the only thing I've ever seen that does that. It caught me out the first time I saw it. I was like, what the? And it's the only time I've ever seen something odd like that. <laughs> you got to love vendors just making up IPv6 standards as they go. Just riffing just, it. <laughs> just, oh, well, let's do this. Sure. Yeah. And we've mentioned this before, the documentation prefix address space. So if you're if you're reading a textbook or one of our books, you'll see 2001 colon DB8, which is really 2001 colon zero DB8. <laughs> I removed a leading zero there in the second hectet. That's a slash 32 prefix that's used for documentation and training purposes. It looks like a global unicast address because it starts with the number two, right. but it's really reserved not to be used on the internet. But you'll see that used often when you start to learn about IPv6 or you re read one of our books. But it's not something you should configure in a real network. Right. There's no guarantee that it's it's going to work properly, depending on the stack that's parsing it and, and deciding what to do with it. It may uh, it may cause you headaches. I, I think you can get away with it in some environments, maybe not in others. But then I think you also run into, and this is something that I think we, we've mentioned on the show before, and we end up kind of gnashing our teeth about this, depending on who's doing it and how effectively they're capturing the use of particular address ranges to use for documentation, because you'll certainly see the documentation range being used for demonstration purposes in documentation. But of course, you'll see a lot of other address ranges in IPv6 being used in documentation that may not necessarily conform to the standards and may create confusion or headaches if you're trying to figure out like, well, why did they use this range? And I'm thinking in particular of unique local addressing. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of examples of unique local addressing and documentation. Yeah. And then another address, an IPv6 address that you'll run into is the loopback address. So in IPv6, we write that as colon, colon, one. It's all zeros right, and a one at the very end, and it gets fully compressed to just colon, colon, one. And that is the IPv6 loopback address for within a host operating system virtual interface that's used you know, to communicate maybe between processes. And in IPv4, you're familiar with 127.0.0.1. That's the IPv4 loopback address. So you'll see your loopback adapter on your computer, and it'll have 127.0.0.1, and you'll see colon colon one likely on it already. So that's a special IPv6 address you may run into as well. Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't know. Anything else we should cover? Did we get the basics when it comes to IPv6 addresses? Yeah, there's other wacky IPv6 addresses out there. You'll see DNS64, well-known prefix called 64 colon FF9B. That doesn't look like any other IPv6 address. There's some other weird and wacky IPv6 addresses that are defined by the Internet Assigned Number Authority as this special registry. We'll put a link in it in the show notes. But there's some odd IPv6 addresses you may encounter here and there. But no, I think we've covered the basics and we've covered the rules of IPv6 addresses. And if you don't follow the rules, you're going to get sucked into the 128-bit address space wormhole. <laughs> <laughs> Never to come out the other side. <laughs> Never. Like, like the terrible Disney movie Black Hole. Now I'm going to make some nerd enemies by saying that. But there, I said it. I guess the other maybe resource to take a peek at just to, to keep everyone on the same page in terms of how these addresses get presented, that RFC 5952, which gives you some some rules about presenting an IPv6 address. And, and uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the dropping leading zeros and using a double colon for multiple all zero hextets. And there, there's some additional, uh, maybe rules is too strong of a word, uh, suggestions about, you know, keeping that consistent. And then, of course, the eternal question, uppercase or lowercase, which 5952 is, is kind enough to tell us, uh, use lowercase. But of course, in the wild, you'll see both uppercase and lowercase letter characters in hexadecimal. I'm looking at you, Cisco IOS for uppercase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cisco routers shouting at you all the time in capital <laughs> IPv6 letters. Everything is exclamation point. Yeah. But use lowercase letters. That's polite. If nothing else, we're always polite here on IPv6 Buzz. We do duplicate address detection. We don't just assume that we... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. But we are optimistic when it comes to duplicate address detection. Yeah. I think that's the basics.
Thanks for listening to IPv6 Buzz, a podcast devoted to truth, justice, and 128 bits of address space. IPv6